Grief. And then I and, and sometimes they're wearing like their winter clothes and they're bundled up in their dorm rooms. All right. Well, I see it is five o'clock now, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna start. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Flagstaff Festival of Science board member Sherry Schaefer, and welcome to the live stream of Rabbits for Dinner and Deer for Tools: The Zooarchaeology of the Wupatki. Uh, and before we I, we begin, I'd like to thank our festival sponsors, especially our supernova friends, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Arizona Community Foundation of Flagstaff, Northern Arizona University, Flagstaff Arts Council, the City of Flagstaff, Better Business Bureau, and W.L. Gore and Associates. Um, as I said earlier, if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the submission questions box provided on the website that's you're probably on it now sci-fi 2020 sci 2020.org um, and we'll try to get as many as we can in at the end of the presentation also be sure to provide any feedback by using the qr code or the button near the top of the sci 2020 page so without further ado i'd like to introduce dr christina burke faculty member of nau's anthropology department and her team of student researchers thank you very much Hello, everyone. How are you doing tonight? Safe and cozy in your homes, hopefully. Um, I wanted to introduce myself uh, again. Thank you, Sherry. I'm Christina Burke. I'm a teacher here at NAU in anthropology, and I am a zooarchaeologist, which by the end of our presentation, you will understand a bit more. Uh, today, we are in lovely Bilby Research Center, which you can see the roof of in some of my students' images. Um, it's a giant uh, dome. Uh, it's a smaller giant dome in the middle of our campus. So you're going to see us taking our masks off when it's time for us to talk. I'm going to share my, my uh, presentation now with you so that you can get an idea of what it is we're going to talk about today. So uh, as archaeologists in Arizona, one of the things that um, we're really interested in is ceramics, right? Pottery and understanding a lot about how uh, pottery was a necessary part of protecting food, storing materials that were needed, storing water here in the Southwest. And so a lot of times you hear about the archaeology of pottery. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is something a little bit different that sometimes gets confused with paleontology and the study of dinosaurs, and that is zooarchaeology. So I want to give you a little rundown of what we're going to cover today, and then we'll start getting into our presentation. And we really want to answer questions you have. So as they said, make sure you get those questions out there for us. So we're going to start out by describing a little bit about Wupaki National Monument, you know, one of our favorite places here in northern Arizona and one that a lot of our school children are really familiar with because they travel there regularly. Um, we're going to define and show a little bit about what zooarchaeology is, which is why I have my students here so that they can help explain some of this stuff. Um, we're going to identify some of the questions we had for research. Why are we talking about rabbits? Why are we talking about deer? Um, we're going to talk about some of the methods we use to do our research, our results, some of the exciting things that we, th well, exciting, we think are exciting things that we learned, and we're hopefully going to get you to think they're exciting. And then we will kind of conclude and get to a point where we can ask your questions or answer your questions. So when we think about um, where we're at here in the world, uh, one of the places that we are is northern Arizona, which a lot of times people come up here uh, that are my family and, and they're from Michigan where there's lots of trees and they're like, oh, I thought all of Arizona was a desert. So we have to talk about how we are a high desert, yes, but we also have a lot of variability. And one of the sites up here in Northern Arizona that sort of helps us understand that is Wupaki National Monument. And as I said, most of you have probably seen um, the Pueblo at Wupaki, the one near the visitor center, been to the ball court, um, walked on the trails and sort of saw this beautiful landscape that we get to call home. Um, we know archaeologically that um, a community of individuals lived in the region for a very long time, uh, most likely upwards of 14, 15,000 years ago, um, and that over the course of time, as the different animals emerged on the landscape or animals went extinct, like mammoth or mastodon, that these populations adopted agriculture. 
Um, and as they adopted agriculture, one of the big questions we've always had is, okay, once you have those um, vegetable materials that you can consume, did that mean that people stopped consuming animals? And if they didn't stop consuming animals, um, what sort of diet um, in terms of what animals were they consuming and how did that kind of play into the relationships they had with these animals across the landscape? So when we look at Wupaki National Monument uh, archeology, span right, all of the, the animal bones, the pottery, the things that have been excavated from the site and then stored at the Museum of Northern Arizona, we decided to you know, ask those questions and look at each intricate bone. At the end of the day, we recorded over 30,000 animal bones that had come out of this archeology span site um, between about 8,100 and 8,250. And that really allowed us to get a bigger picture understanding besides we know they were eating corn and there was inclusion of wild, uh, wild plants and beans and squash and that they would have potentially been fishing and consuming birds. And then also the animals right in their backyard, veg uh, vegetables, those aren't animals, uh, <laughs> rabbits and deer. So just to kind of set us at where we're at, you can kind of imagine some of these early agricultural communities as really relying heavily on animals that are right there, not necessarily going in long distances to get that material. And so that's part of what our focus is going to be here today. Okay, so one thing, one important thing now to talk about is what is zooarchaeology? So zooarchaeology, which is basically the focus of our presentation, is the study of animal bones in archaeological contexts. So when we first find an animal bone in an archaeology site, we have to start by carefully excavating it. So instead of a shovel, we may use a trowel and brushes to sort of slowly dig around the bones so that we don't accidentally break it. Um, in the field, we'll sort of roughly clean it using a brush and we'll place the bones in a large bag. Um, and then finally, we'll write down what site it was recovered from and where it was located in that site. Then after that, once we get into the lab, we'll start by cleaning the bones using a dry toothbrush, just like this. Um, and we do this because if we get them wet, they can actually break and um, dry and crack, uh, which creates more problems for us um, and makes it harder to analyze the bones. So we sort of clean it just by taking a bone and sort of using a toothbrush to sort of clean and get all that dust and dirt off. Um, after that, we assign each bone an identification number, and then we work to determine what bone uh, we're holding is and what animal it comes from. And Eric will talk a little bit more about that later. Finally, we place each little bone into its own plastic bag with a label just like this. So what are some of the questions we actually wanted to know based on um, all of the materials we found at this site? As Max mentioned, zooarchaeology just studies animal bones, but as he pointed out, it's from archaeology sites, not necessarily things like dinosaurs. So really the question is always, well, what animals were they eating, right? When we think about studying animals in archaeology sites, it's predominantly the animals they were consuming. Um, but one of the things that we started to notice as we were recording all of the animal bones from this particular site is that not all of those animal bones were um, indicative or demonstrating that they were consuming them. They were eating them with their dinner, their lunch, breakfast, things of that nature. So what we started to question, and one of the things we had started to see in these archeology span sites were artifacts made from bone. Right? So we'd see things that had been um, whole complete bones at one point, and then what had happened is they had been broken, shaped, modified to be used uh, for other reasons, such as needles for sewing. So we wanted to look at these bone artifacts and see if it could help us identify anything about the activities or behaviors of the people living in this particular environment. Because across the world, not every community needs the same types of tools. 
The other thing we were really interested in, and as a lab for you know training students in this research and trying to learn about past cultures um, by looking at these artifacts, we also wanted to know, is it possible for us to recreate these tools? Could we get the rabbit skeletal bones, you know, the, the different leg pieces, the different arm pieces? Could we get pieces from a deer and actually recreate a bone needle? After we did some recreation of those bone needles, then we had some more questions. We wanted to know what were they used for? Once we created them, could we um, mimic or, or create that process of sewing or making baskets or maybe punching through leather? And so this project becomes so much bigger. We've been working on it for almost three years. And even though the big question is, well, what did they eat besides you know, the agricultural crops that they were growing? We also wanted to know more about how animals are important to us in other ways in everyday lives, not necessarily just for the food that we eat. And so we started to think about it in a bigger context. When we come back though to that question of what animals did they eat, the biggest thing that we really wanted to think about in the what animals did they eat context is were they going very long distances to get food, right? Were they leaving their agricultural fields and going out into the world and hunting bison that we know were in Colorado at the time and bringing those materials back? Were they going high up into the mountains to get bighorn sheep? Um, were they hunting smaller animals around them like um, pocket gophers or mice or even squirrels? So we started to investigate a concept that's often discussed here in the Southwest referred to as the garden hunting hypothesis. So a big portion of what our research at Upaki was, was kind of revolving around, like Dr. Burke said, what, what were these people eating? And essentially we kind of focused on this hypothesis called the garden hunting hypothesis, which was proposed by uh, the archeologist Olga Linares. And it basically, it suggests that people hunted and were eating pests that were subsisting off of their home gardens and larger agricultural crops that were present. And essentially this was a substitute for domesticating animals and relying on hunting during times where nutrients in animals were um, basically hard to come by and there was a deficiency in obtaining those nutrients. And so what garden hunting does is it essentially provides an alternative source of uh, obtaining protein, but it also, uh, it also helps these people manage their crops and remove these pests that are essentially um, could be destroying crops, gardens, and so forth. And additionally, what this hypothesis somewhat you know, accounts for is the higher content of small mammals in Southwest faunal assemblages, you know, such as jackrabbits, cottontails. And you know, this is something that is noted across um, numerous assemblages found in the Southwest you know, after doing faunal analysis. And what's noticed is when subsisting on rabbits increases, um, or I'm sorry, it increases as reliance on agriculture increases. So there is a bit of a correlation where we're noticing more um, smaller mammals being consumed as a means of subsistence as uh, more and more people are relying on uh, agriculture as a means of um, subsistence. I keep muting myself, you're gonna to have to bear with me. So in terms of the research that we do, um, we are zooarchaeologists, as I mentioned. So one of the things that we do as zooarchaeologists is identify the bones and the fragments of bones. You can see in the image over here on the right, all of these little pieces of bone, fragments of bone, um, so that we can understand you know, what bones do we have, right? All humans, all animals, all life that has a skeleton that is internal like ours have 206 bones in their body, except for some animals have tails. So there's a little bit extra in terms of those bones. So 
when you have 206 plus bones to deal with, we have to try to identify what bone do we have here? Because that a lot of times can help us identify the fourth idea, which is how many animals do we have? Because no animal has two you know, left legs. So we first start out trying to identify what bone we have, but then it's not just about what bone do we have, but what animal does it come from? And when we think about what animals that the bones come from, if you look right now, if you're in your living room, you look at your cat and your dog, maybe you have a mini pig, hopefully, because they're cute. You can see that there's different shapes to their bodies. That actually means that inside their bones have different shapes. So being able to identify what bone we have and then what animal that bone comes from is pretty much the majority of what I teach in my zooarchaeology class. The next thing that we're really interested in is what happened to the bone, right? There's a lot of different things that can happen to bone. If you look at this bone up here on the left, you'll notice that down the center of it, there's a nice long split. And that's not the way the bone was when the animal was living. So we're interested in finding out who created that. Was it created by humans? Was it created by other animals? What kind of caused this this um, damage or destruction to the bone. And then finally, with all of that information, how many animals do we have? Are we looking at two rabbits that had been broken up into teeny tiny pieces? Or are we looking at thousands of rabbits that had been consumed over time? So zooarchaeology is a skill set that requires us to have an understanding of the different animals in the world. So a lot of us will take a class in mammalogy or zoology, even ornithology. Um, we also have to have some understanding of anatomy. So a lot of us take classes in anatomy, understanding osteology things of that nature, because it helps us really identify um, how they would have moved, right? If we're looking at a bone and we're trying to figure out what animal it is, we have to also understand how our muscles attach to those bones. So zooarchaeology, even though it, it kind of trains us on a lot of information that could be used in many fields of the sciences and social sciences, Zooarchaeology is really specific to um, us here in anthropology because we really want to know how did we interact with animals throughout all of our existence. So the first thing to kind of think about is, well, how do you actually identify a bone? So I'm going to let Eric talk about that. All right. So when you're identifying uh, an element or a bone from any animal, you have to start off by trying to figure out what bone you have. Um, so in these pictures, uh, we're gonna talk about the femur uh, as one example. Uh, in archeology, span you really can end up with any portion of the bone. It can be any fragment, any piece. Uh, so you have to really understand the entirety of every bone. Um, so you really start um, with what area is the bone coming from? Is it coming from the limbs or is it coming from the skull or is it coming from the backbone? Those are the main spots a lot of people start. Uh, any section of the femur is going to be longer and more um, cylindrical, so you're going to identify it as a long bone coming from a limb. Uh, so with the femur, you're going to realize that it's a limb and you're going to start out and any portion you have, you have to start to identify. And as you see in the largest picture uh, in the bottom left-ish kind of area of the slide, there's a lot of features that are identified. They're not important necessarily um, to know every single one for this presentation, but we do need to know them. Uh, we need to know how it fits into the joint in the hip. We need to know how it fits at the knee uh, with this portion at the bottom of the bone. Um, and we need to know kind of how the shaft uh, or the main portion of the bone is set up. Otherwise, uh, we could get a fragment that shows a feature from the shaft, but we don't know it because we don't know the full shape. So it's really important to really understand every bone in the body. Uh, once we understand what element we're talking about, the next most important thing is trying to figure out what animal we, are, we have. Um, so there's a little bit of a process to this. First, we try to figure out what type of animal we're talking about. Um, and this is a really general, like, is it a mammal? Is it a reptile? Is it a bird? Um, mammal bones, we have learned in zoarchaeology, typically are denser and heavier 
than bird bones. Uh, so that's one of the things that we run into a lot in the Southwest is we'll have deer, which are mammals, or we'll have maybe we'll run into some turkeys at some points, which are a lot lighter because they're bird bones. And that's important because you move on to what we call size class, which is just a fancy word of putting animal sizes into categories. So the largest animals are we call uh, size class five. All that's important is they're the largest animals. Size class one is the smallest. Uh, so, but each size is specific to the type of animal it is. So a mammal size class, a size class five is something like a deer, uh, which is very large, but when you compare it to birds, um, the largest birds are in the Southwest are gonna be like turkeys. So when we're talking about that, we have to start there and it really narrows down the amount of animals we're talking about. If we're talking about size class five birds, we know it's likely either a turkey, an eagle or hawk, something of that nature. Um, and we have a few ways that we go about um, figuring it out once we're at that point. Our lab houses uh, comparative collections, uh, which we have labeled in our lab. And so this is our mule deer and we box it and label it. And we have all the bones to compare and see what features line up and are similar. And when we don't have comparative to use in our lab, we often uh, fall to books. Uh, one book that we use in zooarchaeology a lot is this, and it has pictures of all different types of animal bones and skulls in it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really visual, visual in, uh, from there, but it's really helpful uh, when we don't have the comparative to rely on. So to kind of jump back to, um, you know, what exactly were the people at Wupaki eating uh, based on what we observed in our assemblages, you know, and, anal and sorry, analyzing, um, you know, the bones that were found using methods that Eric just described. Um, what we found out was that the primary animals people at Wupaki used were uh, rabbits, such as one being the cottontail, it's kind of hard to see, and jackrabbit, which little a little bigger, but I don't know if you guys saw that. And essentially deer, such as uh, white-tailed white -tailed deer and pronghorn. And basically um, we look for, for signs like cut marks and other modifications on remains. And based on the cut marks that we did observe in the assemblages, um, rabbits like cottontails and jackrabbit were the predominant source for food. Um, however, close, kind of closely followed by deer. But um, like mentioned kind of in the slide with the elk photo, there wasn't much, um, there weren't many other animals that we observed were being used for subsistence, such as elk. And, you know, while other remains were present in the assemblages, such as birds, reptiles, and um, a few other mammals like dogs, elk, et cetera, they don't make up the majority of the animals that are um, showing up in the assemblage and rarely show signs of human modifications relating to subsistence uh, like butchery or tool making. And this essentially backs up the idea that the garden hypothesis proposes that it's easier to, you know, to go after these smaller animals that are within um, a better range versus you know, traveling however many miles to go hunt and possibly rely on not capturing anything. And because there was this abundance of rabbit specifically, uh, to us, this essentially confirms that the people inhabiting Wupaki were exploiting animals in their gardens for food while also being able to maintain uh, their crops from pests that could be potentially destroying um, future, future food, so. All right, so uh, as Mitch was talking about, there are some modifications that show up um, in the bones that we have. And uh, we call that taphonomy, which is really just what happens to the bones after the animal uh, is dead. Um, and so, so those things can include both natural and cult cultural modifications. Um, natural modifications are things that happen from the environment impacting that bone. 
Um, so as you can see listed, there's root etching, animal nine and exfoliation. Animal nine, um, one example right here, uh, I don't know if you can see great, but it's actually carnivore nine. Um, and so as you can see, it's chipped away at the top uh, and it's got a few tooth scores that you're unable to see as much, but it's from the animal, an animal feeding on that animal and leaving that behind, showing us that other animals were involved in um, the aftermath of that animal's life. There also are um, herbivore uh, gnawing marks um, that you can see in the top right uh, in that picture. We have an example in our lab, but it's impossible to see over the camera. So I would refer to that rib, which has the deep grooves in it um, from uh, herbivores gnawing at it to get calcium into their diet. Um, these, the exfoliation happens a lot of times with weathering and sun exposure where you're losing the outside of the bone. Uh, and we see a lot of that, especially in the Southwest when bones aren't immediately getting buried. Um, besides natural modifications, cultural modifications are really important because as Mitch was talking about identifying what animals were being eaten and what weren't, that's how we do it. Cultural modification is key to that. Cut marks uh, are indicators of butchery. And so uh, they're often just really straight, nice marks in the bone that we see. And we use those to identify um, the butchery methods and if the animal is butchered. Um, there's also scrape marks and burning. Burning is a really obvious one that's often due um, to cooking of something. And there's actually different stages of it. In this, you can see it's very blackened. Um, and then towards the top, it starts to brown off. Um, and then there's no white in this, but we actually do get a white coloring to bones that are like overcooked almost. Like you, they're, they're so far um, burned that they've actually changed the structure of the bone. Uh, different than the charring of the black and the brown is just a light like burn as if um, meat was still on it and it got touched by the fire towards the end of where the meat was still present. Uh, and this is all really important in understanding what's going on. Okay, so archaeologists at Wapaki recovered an impressive number of bone artifacts. Almost, almost all of them were made from deer metapodials, part of the feet, or jackrabbit radii, the lower arm bone. Most, many of these artifacts are classified as tools, either awls or needles. But there are shape and size differences for these tools, but there are shape and size differences for these tools, and we are interested in understanding why. Using information from previous researchers, we identified three types of awls and separated those from needles. First, we have blunt tipped awls, which are lenticular or bean shaped um, and at the tip um, and are longer and thicker than fine tipped awls. Fine tip balls, on the other hand, have a more round cross section with an extremely fine point. Um, there's light polishing and sharpening usually seen on these. Finally, there are ulna awls, um, which often have wear on the sides of the tips, and they are always crafted from an ulna. Needles, on the other hand, are evenly polished over the entire surface and often have a hole opposite the top of the sharp end. So how do we learn about prehistoric tool use and what is use wear analysis? So use wear is defined as human produced striations, polish, or absence of striations on worked bone. Second, use wear is examined through a microscope to identify tip shape and how much it was used. You're probably wondering, what on earth is a striation? These are minute shallow grooves or channels that often parallel each other and look like little lines. Polish is shown as shininess. Now, if you're wondering what in the what in the universe would create these striations in bone? That's what we wondered too. First, we used a hand lens to make observations of tools like what jewelers um, use to examine bone, uh, stones or like a small version of what the dwarves used in Snow White. Um, second, we used a digital microscope with a 20 times um, 50 magnification um, to take 
photos of striations at the tip in the mid shaft or the middle of each tool. And this was then at the NAU Imaging Histology Core facility. Third, we measured the distance from the tip of the tool to where striations began. Finally, we identified measurement averages for each tool type to identify pattern. We also used the microscope to render 3D images of each tool to measure the depth of striations at the tip in the mid shaft of the tool. After looking through the microscope at all the striations, we noticed clusters of transverse, diagon diagonal, and longitudinal striations. Considering the various taphonomic ways they can form, we wondered if it was trampling. Trampling of bones on the ground could create striations, right? If a bone is on the savanna and a herd of elephants goes over it, that's gonna do some damage to the bone. However, trampling marks usually are all over the place in every direction, not clustered as you can see in the slide. So we switched gears and wondered if these striations could be linked to specific human activities, punching leather, for example. This led to our next thought. Let's perform our own experiment. So within archaeology, we have many different kinds of subfields or specialties, zooarchaeology being one of them. But a bigger one that zooarchaeology sometimes falls under is referred to as experimental archaeology. Basically, experimental archaeology is trying to understand the different ways that um, these tools could have been created. So we used experimental archaeology, as I said, and we also got um, animal bones from a local wildlife butcher, um, mostly elk, but we got a bunch of uh, mule deer as well. And we decided that we wanted to understand a little bit about how do we go from this lower picture here on the left of a bone that's been broken all the way to this bone picture on the far right, which is a needle or an awl type of uh, a projection. So one of the things we were thinking about, as Megan had just mentioned, is that there are different striations in these bones. And we wondered, does the process of creating the bone tool create the striations? Or are the striations actually created by using the tool? So before we continue, um, it's important to define experimental archaeology. So this research is, like Dr. Burke mentioned, is an example of experimental archaeology. Um, so this is in which archaeologists attempt to recreate uh, past behaviors using materials that would have been available to the people at the time. So an example of this is if an archaeologist wants to know how people in the Southwest created stone tools, they might try to do it themselves and they would use rocks from around Flagstaff to see if they could recreate that same tool. So we sort of did something similar. Our experimental methods and process began as an activity for a course. Um, a couple of my students, Megan included, decided that they wanted to understand um, how these tools could be made. So the first thing that they did is they went into the archaeology bones we had received from the Museum of Northern Arizona and they started to separate and identify all of the different stages that could represent how you take uh, the, the bone of an animal and turn it into a tool. Once they had identified the stages we see archeologically, they obtained those bones. So as I said previously, we had a local wildlife butcher who gave us a ton of deer bones. In fact, we have a freezer in my lab just full of deer legs. Um, the bone that was used was the metapodial. And a metapodial is generally part of the foot. And if you look at the palm of your hand, you have metacarpals, which is a type of metapodial in the palm of your hand. You have five of them. In animals like deer, they have one big one. And sometimes you'll see it referred to as a cannon bone. What we did is soak those in water because we wanted to see what is the process of breaking that bone because bones, once an animal dies, are not filled with the blood and soft tissue and um, other kinds of fluids that are part of a living body. And it's not nearly as, as soft once there is none of that stuff kind of pumping through it. So 
the students did some research and one of the things that they found is that um, there is uh, ethnographic research suggesting that communities in the past would have soaked those bones in urine or pee. And so we were a little kind of worried about that. And we also didn't know if it would be appropriate for us all to pee in a bucket and then put a bone in. So we used water, significantly more hygienic. We also wanted to look and see what kinds of stone materials were being used. So we used obsidian, which is a volcanic glass, the stuff that you normally think of as coming from places like Northern California, um, Oregon, um, and we do have obsidian up here in Northern Arizona. And then chert, which is um, the standard kind of rock material that most people think of as flint. When we soaked those bones in water, and used all of these stone materials, we had to think about how long would it actually take for us to, you know, get the bone soft enough where we could actually use it to uh, make a tool or where we would actually be able to break it down enough to see that the actual sharpness forming in that tool. So we initially started with soaking them for a little bit, a couple hours. And that wasn't enough. We soaked it overnight for longer periods of time. And that turned out to not really be enough as well, because as the bone started to dry, it actually got a lot harder. And so that made it much more difficult for us to actually break into it. A second experiment we ended up doing was to heat treat them, which means we simmered them in really hot water for uh, an extended period of time and then actually let it cool just a little bit so that we could actually start to break it down. After we got the bone to a softness, you can see some of the images of the students um, starting to remove any kind of extra flesh that was on it. Because we know that they weren't leaving the hides or the tendons in the materials that they were making the tools with. Those things were being removed. So we had to start by removing those tendons. Then after we had looked at all the archaeological materials, one of the things we found is that a lot of these metapodial bones often had this really long incision down the middle of them, right? All the way down the shaft of the bone. And so we started wondering, well, how do you make that? And the students started using different techniques with different bones. And they actually were able to split these bones and then break them, which you can see in the third image over. And it kind of breaks off of the bottom of the bone. Then they would use just like we would think of um, in terms of like breaking down corn or other food materials, a hammer stone and actually breaking or chipping away the top part of the bone to shape it so that eventually we could make it sharper. We use sandstone, a local, uh, locally available material to actually grind the bone down where we, and you can see in the second picture here where they would actually rub the tip of that bone across that sandstone for a really long period of time until we got to these nice tips. After we created all of these awls, you know, they're beautiful and we're really excited about them. We wanted to actually know more about um, if they could actually, you know, in fact, be used to do anything. Could they be used to break down, um, you know, leather, punch through leather. And so the thing that we started to do was punch leather. And we wanted to see again, remember, we're wondering how are these striations created? How many striations may be created? So we set a standard of punching leather 50 times with one of these tools, then 100 times, then 500 times, and then 1,000 times. And then what we decided to do was look at that under a microscope so we could see what that might look like. So through analyzing these tools, we discovered a huge amount, um, around 80% of bone tools come from the Wupaki Pueblo, which if you're going and visiting the site is the main Pueblo that you walk up to. Um, we hypothesized that because there are so many bones at Wupaki Pueblo, tools at other sites may have been reworked. So when Dr. Burke was talking about grinding, after you use um, the tools a lot for say like punching leather, they're not as sharp, but you don't throw the whole tool away. You want to keep using it. Um, so you would re-grind the awl to make the tip sharp again. 
and continue using it. Um, so we hypothesize that because there aren't as many tools, then maybe they didn't have as many resources. So they were using what they had essentially um, until they couldn't use it anymore. Um, however, this hypothesis was really difficult to test because only two sites had needles um, and others may have had one or two alls, which really messed with our um, data. So we weren't able to come with any um, real conclusions on that. Um, however, in the future to conclusively show if the smaller sites do show signs of more use through, through re reworking, um, we would also need to include the data from the other half of tools, which are housed at the Arizona State Museum down in Tucson. you do that? Ah. Okay. Uh, one second, I'm having a computer error. We're having technological difficulties. Is necessary for every presentation to be actual academics. So um, if you're looking along the bottom row of pictures, that kind of shows you the um, difference between when we were punching leather, zero punches, all the way to a thousand punches. This took a very, very long amount of time. Um, but essentially, at 50 punches, the tip becomes transparent and rounded. At 100 punches, the transparency of the tip moves up the shaft. And at 500 punches, the transparency is more intense and the striations at the tip begin to fade away. At 1,000 punches, the tip is rounded and blunt. Transparency is the first millimeter and striations to the tip are completely worn away. So striations are visible on the awl before being used to punch through leather. And this suggests that the striations are a result of manufacture, not use wear. So every time um, we resharpened the tools in between punching, the striations would appear again. So we know that because we're seeing striations on the bone tools from Wapaki, that they're not being used in this kind of leather punching activity, which would have worn the striations away. Um, this patterning is present on all three experimental tools that we created. Um, and so again, we just do not think that they were used for hide working. The amount of investment required for all production as seen in this project does not seem realistic. There's most likely a different way to soften the bone to manufacture it or different lithic raw material that might be more effective at cutting through bone. So our first goal was figuring out what these past populations were eating, right? Um, in that earlier hypothesis we were talking about, the garden hunting hypothesis, that was 100% supported through our research. Um, second, based on the sheer number of bone tools found at the site, there may have been, they may have been manufactured in-house um, just because there was lots of people living there. Or another theory is that they were being traded out. So Paki Pueblo was having more people, had more um, production where certain people were just making these tools and then they could be given and traded for other goods to surrounding Pueblos. Based on our experiments, it's also clear that the awls were not used for punching leather like we discussed. Um, however, when we looked more into weaving basketry, more modern tools for weaving baskets look just like the awls we're seeing in the archeological record. Um, and the needles were likely used for sewing just like we do today. However, there is a lot more research to do on this. Um, and I think that's something that we would need a cultural expert to help us out on. Finally, we need to conduct more research to understand what other tools were used for. We had a lot more stuff than just all the needles. Like this is a super interesting tool. And then we also have pendants like this and shells that could be hung like this. So at the end of the day, why does this matter? Why does, uh, why does zooarchaeology exist besides the fact that we really like bones and they think that they're really interesting? 
Well, one of the things that we're trying to do in this lab and we think is really important is that we can do research on materials that were excavated in the past and not necessarily have to excavate new points. Um, one of the big things we want to advocate for is um, realizing that when we dig up a site, excavate it, no matter how scientific our methods are, we are doing damage to people's past. And we're often doing damage to people's past that are not us. Uh, the people that work in my lab are white European descendants and we're excavating indigenous American sites. So we think that this is important because what we've shown is that we can continue to do research um, without necessarily having to go and dig up a new site and instead can pay respect to communities by looking at the sites that have already been destroyed and are now stored at museums in the Southwest. The Museum of Northern Arizona has animal bones for me and my students to do research on for the rest of our career, right? Uh, we can keep doing this forever. We only touched a little bit with 30,000 bones at Wupaki. We currently have materials um, from other sites here in Northern Arizona that we're starting to do research on. And one of the big goals for my career is to give back to the community. This stuff is sitting there in boxes and really, really deserves to be understood so that we can educate people on how people interacted with animals through time. In fact, one of the things that Megan is working on is research I started um, seven years ago to understand how dogs and humans interacted here in the American Southwest. Uh, prehistorically, how we interact with our dogs today, and to kind of understand how that relationship is still very similar and very um, emotionally connected to our existence. So we just wanted to thank you for allowing us to talk at the Science Festival again. Last year we were at the Science Festival at Willow Bend, maybe you had seen us there. Um, we present this research in a lot of places at the museum, um, to the Northern Arizona Archaeology Society, because we think it's really important to help people understand um, how, how valuable um, archaeological knowledge can be to educating the public. Uh, and really, it helps us learn about all of the people in the world and how humans have really um, you know, adapted to all sorts of changes in our landscape, our environment, um, to eating different animals. You know, people in the Southwest started eating mammoth. Well, mammoth aren't roaming around anymore, so now we have to eat rabbit. And that seems like such an odd thing to think about, but really that's what we've looked at and what we're understanding. Um, one of the last things I want to say is, honestly, without the Museum of Northern Arizona, I wouldn't have this opportunity. I have great relationship with Gwen Galestein at the museum and uh, we work together. We get bones to students for theses. We put out this research and give students the experiential learning that they need in order to have productive careers in the future. So I really appreciate her and the museum and I appreciate all my students and the hard work that they've put into this. I feel like a mother that's just smiling at how wonderful they were today. Um, so I wanna thank you for paying attention and being present with us. And we are here to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. Really appreciate uh, you and your student researchers. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, it takes a couple of minutes to get folks in asking questions because we are on a 30 to 60 second delay uh, from when we're talking to when it goes up on our website. So we're going to wait a couple seconds for folks to submit questions. If you have any folks watching, please, please uh, go to the um, submit questions box that is provided on the website and we can ask Dr. Burke and crew uh, what's going on. Uh, but to get things started, I'm going to ask one myself. Um, what, why is garden hunting important to talk about? It's actually, it's a new concept for me. Well, you know, and I can have the students chime in on this too. One of the reasons why we're really interested in this garden hunting hypothesis, it was initially presented, as was mentioned, um, by Olga Linares, and it was presented 
uh, mostly to understand the ancient Maya and how they interacted with the animals in their gardens. And it's discussed here in the Southwest. It's showing up at research by zooarchaeologists at the University of New Mexico. And we think it's important because it shows that people are adaptable, right? You know, you don't necessarily have to um, just stop whatever you're doing because the mammoth went extinct, you know, or that <laughs> the deer herds are not nearly as large as they used to. One of the things that's really unique that we often forget is that all people have this ability to adapt. We're very cognizant of our environment. We know what animals are present. And um, I think it helps us understand that people in the past were not primitive. They weren't somebody that was in the past. And so that means that it's a, a negative connotation. Instead, we're looking at what we all do. If a restaurant closes down in Flagstaff, I mean, I'm sure everybody remembers when Kentucky Fried Chicken closed down and everybody's like, where am I going to get my fried chicken? And now we got tons of places, right? Like people are adaptable through time and space, which is something that connects us all. Well, thank you. Well, we got our first question. Uh, Molly from San Francisco. Hey, San California. Uh, wants to know how uh, did the students get interested in this field? I think we will start with Megan. Um, so I got interested. I went on a field school to Belize um, and worked at Shunantanich with Dr. Burke and a lot of other NAU faculty. Um, and, you know, we were talking and one of my other friends started volunteering in her lab and I was like, I'm taking zooarchaeology next semester. Can I volunteer in her lab? That sounds so cool. And she said, yes. Um, and so I was able to just start like cleaning animal bones, um, kind of like what Max was showing earlier with the toothbrush um, while I was actually in the zooark class. So I hadn't learned anything yet, but it was a really good like hands-on experience. Um, and since then, we were able to do the tool, the uh, bone tool project and all that experiment stuff. And I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. This is amazing. All right. So um, I also went on the field school uh, in Belize and I ended up working with Dr. Burke. Uh, I was a forestry major at the time. And somehow I convinced my loving parents to fund me to go to learn more about archaeology. Um, and I loved working with animals, but I didn't love everything that went along with forestry. And I kept bugging Dr. Burke when I heard about zooarchaeology. And I learned about um, applied zooarchaeology, which is another term where we use it more currently to work for conservation efforts. And I continued to bother her as, as long as she would uh, <laughs> take my questions. And eventually she just said, well, why don't you come work in my lab next semester? And she converted me to anthropology, which is my major now. And uh, the rest is history. Kind of. <laughs> well, and Max and Eric are being a little modest in their kind of, they're my newbies in the lab right now. Both of them actually applied for the Hooper undergraduate research grant last year. And they've both been funded for about $3,000 to continue doing this research. So NAU um, has a lot of energy towards helping undergraduates get this research experience. So both of them, you know, they get brought in and then we slowly start to help them learn how to apply for money and then develop their own research questions, which hopefully we'll present next year at the Flagstaff Festival of Science. Wonderful, and I look forward to that. Um, I've got another question. Sloan from Flagstaff wants to know uh, what weapons did the inhabitants use to hunt? It, would that be any different than what your more hunting tribes would do? I think uh, there's a lot of different things that you can use for hunting. Um, at this time period in the Southwest um, and across the nation, the bow and arrow would have been prevalent. Um, so populations would have absolutely used the bow and arrow. Um, and that's kind of globally, right? It's a great technology and so everybody uses it. But in the context of rabbits, um, there's a lot of information that shows that rabbits would have maybe been corralled and gathered, right? Because you always hear the saying that you're breeding like rabbits. Well, rabbits breed in a lot of kind of numbers and quantities. And so it sounds weird to say, but they kind of herd. Um, and so you could potentially gather a number of rabbits together at, the at a time. 
And in the Great Basin, in Nevada specifically, we actually have evidence of nets that were used that once they got the rabbits running in a certain direction, they could have gathered them and grabbed <laughs> them with a net um, because they're small animals. And sure. so uh, it's, it's almost, I almost think of it like fishing, but um, <laughs> you know how you see those nets that yeah, collect a yeah, lot yeah. of fish. Yeah. Um, so that is a, a lot of what we're, we're thinking was happening here in the Southwest. Though, again, we don't have a time machine. Interesting. Well, that's your next task. I know. Um, another question from David Ross in Flagstaff. He says, great presentation. Thank you. How many students are in your program and what should a high school student be studying to get prepared for taking zooarchaeology in college? Um, in terms of the anthropology program, we have um, over 200, 300 majors. We have a lot of students in our program studying all aspects of cultures in humans through time and space. Um, in terms of wanting to get interested in zooarchaeology, you just got to apply to our program and get here. If you're interested in learning more, some of the classes I would encourage students to take when they're in undergrad is some of the, the biology classes. So you understand animals and understand how to look at taxonomy and species. Um, I know some schools often offer anatomy classes. Even if it's human anatomy, it's still comparable because we all have the same number of bones, so that doesn't hurt them to gain those experiences. Also, a lot of archaeology projects will take seniors. Um, I know that when we worked in Belize with Dr. Awe, who's here at NAU, that we had a high school senior that went out with us. And, and sometimes if you already know that stuff, well, then you email us and we will figure out how to get you involved. Um, and we actually had a, a senior from BASIS working with us here in the lab um, two years ago on animal bones that we had recovered in Belize. And they were doing that for their project. So um, somebody that already knows this is their interest, you know, volunteer where you can, volunteer at the museum, volunteer at Eldon Pueblo, the Forest Service, and then definitely email me and we can start talking about how um, to get you in here and what classes you'll take once you get here. Good advice. Thank you. Uh, another question. This is from Becky and Winslow. Uh, it's a good one. Is garden hunting a beginning to domestication? You know, I don't know. I haven't looked at that. One of the animals we know domesticated in the Southwest was the turkey. Um, in, the, in the Middle East, in, in um, the Fertile Crescent regions of the Middle East, where um, goats, pigs, um, sheep were all domesticated fairly early on, cows domesticated, you know, 11,000, 12,000, 13,000 years ago um, in that region, I don't know if they were actually using the garden hunting hypothesis to domesticate them. That would be a really interesting um, thing to look at. I don't work in that region. And here in the Southwest, we have dogs and turkeys and mm. the turkey domestication could have followed something like that. Turkeys would be in agricultural fields, but I don't actually know the answer to that yet. Maybe they should do a thesis on it. I, I'll let them come work with me. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, that does sound like something. That's a good question. You might not necessarily have to if the rabbits are abundant enough that you can catch them in nets. Yeah. You don't have to worry about caring for them. You just go out when you see that they your crops have been nibbled enough and yeah. take them there. Um, that's, yeah, I'm not makes sure how think, that plays out. Yeah, that, that maybe because they had such an abundance of that sort of thing, that's where they got into the bone tool making industry. As if they weren't using them, that really is, was interesting to me uh, that the, your striation patterns showed that they, they weren't using them the way you thought they were, and they might not have been using them there at all. So, yeah. and if you had shells, that further proves that there must have been some heavy trade going on. Absolutely. That is one of the questions that Gwen had posed to us when we started doing this research is really trying to understand because there is an abundance of those tools there. And one of the things we hesitate to say that is what they were doing is sure. we need to see what it looks like with basketry. And that's mm -hmm. um, like if we could use those tools in basketry, we see that in um, people today using those alls for basketry as Megan made that that really could change things. Maybe those striation pat patterns are remade through that process. But then that would also indicate that potentially things like basketry could be traded. Interesting. Well, that's next semester, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the next project on the way. Yeah. Uh, let's see if we've got anything else going on here. I actually was a little curious. You said that there were really only two bones from each animal that are used for these tools. Mm 
the rest of it just became garbage or it wasn't used for anything else or it could be used for all sorts of things. As Megan showed the little pendant, you can use different portions of, oh. say, the crania or the pelvis bones, right? You could use a lot of those things. It just seems like these two bones, the radius, which is a lower arm bone, and then the metapodials, which ours are really short, but in animals, they're much longer. Sure. Um, they're really hard, they're dense, and they don't have a lot of meat, right? So... They were butchering all the other bones to get meat from. A lot of times they grind the bones, even with a mono and matate, break them down, boil them to get all of the grease and fat sure. out of them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the other bones are still being used. It's just a matter of if those specific ones were just being used for tools because they're so hard and easy to use. That makes sense. That makes sense. They're the most available ones. Yeah, and that's a great question. And, and we wouldn't have known that without looking and seeing these patterns either. Exactly. Well, wonderful. Well, I see it is six o'clock now. I want to thank you very much for participating in the Flagstaff Festival of Science. Um, the next thing that's coming up are the four Sci Talks presented by Sun and Link. Those are at 7.30 p.m. They are 15 minute TED Talk type things. So I hope folks out there watching will join us. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Burke. Thank you, student researchers. Good luck with your next projects. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great night. Stay safe in Flagstaff. Good evening. <laughs>